first if there are any announcements because some people had said there were things they wanted to announce. Carrie, do you want to stop? Uh, real quick, um, I'm Carrie Sleeper, I mean, Lou Sleeper's youngest and most favorite son. <laughs> but today I'm here for the school board selection committee. Um, we've got two people coming off this year. It's a little challenging. Um, I'd like your help. Either consider possibly asking some questions about it for yourself, but more importantly, for people you might know. So, um, where do they where do they send their names? The suggested well, names. Uh, selectioncommittee.org um, is okay. on the web. Or Carrie Sleeper. Okay. Me, uh, Thank you. Any uh, meet me afterwards. I'll give you a card. I'll give you some information. But um, this is a tough one this year. We've got two people coming off. We got a. It's always a challenge, even with one person. So, thank you. Uh, yes. Stand up. Stand up. Friend Snedeker, I'd like to invite you all to uh, sing in the season with the Messiah sing along uh, right here in Oxford. It's called Shh. 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 Um, it's for the Shh. 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 Shh.
Is, is, is this working? Ta-da. Our speaker today is our county executive, and we've asked him to make a, a presentation, uh, indicated a few areas we are particularly interested in. After his presentation, which should run about 15 to 20 minutes, the summit board itself has prepared several questions that we would like to ask him, and then we will turn it over to the audience to, um, to provide some interesting questions, we hope. So without taking any further time, our county executive, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Just for the record, I'm doing this without coffee to start. So good morning. I, w I want to wish everybody <laughs> a happy Hanukkah and a, a Merry Christmas and hopefully a wonderful and blessed 2016. So it's good to be back. I think this is my maybe fourth time, I think. So it's good to be back. And I will um, I'll go through the budget and then I'll go through a little bit on Playland and then kind of just open it up to whatever questions that you have uh, so we can have more of a dialogue. Uh, first of all, the budget obviously is a fluid process. On November 14th, I think it was, I submitted a budget to the county board. Uh, they have until the 27th of December by county charter to adopt the budget. Uh, last night they met pretty late, Catherine, huh? Till something after one o'clock in the morning, I guess. On, um, on working on what's called ads, ads day. So they can put in back into my proposed budget uh, any and all spending that they wish. And then on Friday is the day where they have to sort of balance out that budget and take away um, or add revenue or take away uh, what they put in to make it balanced. And then they'll vote on it, I guess on Monday is scheduled to vote. And then the process goes to me to either approve the budget as a whole or to veto uh, things that I think should be out of there by line items. So that's the, the give and take, which is not unlike what you see in Albany um, or in Washington. So uh, the budget that I had proposed for the sixth straight year uh, is what I think tough but fair and balanced. And it's something that Subjectively, we could all agree or disagree on, on all the different lines in that budget, and there are thousands of lines in that budget. Um, but the one thing that I had said from the very beginning was, we here in New York are the highest taxed state. We here in this county are the highest taxed county in America. Thus, you are the highest taxed Americans in this country. And so we have said from the beginning that we need to bring a little more balance back that we could not continue down the path that we were going. The trajectory for this county, and even in the state, was one that was very detrimental. You know, in this state, we've had a million and a half people leave this state in the last 14 years. And in this county, we've seen how the property taxes are just making it very, very difficult for anyone to live. And that's why Florida is the number one destination, and that's why people are packing up and leaving. And it's getting harder and harder. And if any one of you knows this, raise your hand if you're trying to sell your house. It gets harder and harder when the property taxes are higher and higher because people are saying, I, what do I need that for? So we have to find that balance of what we love, what we expect, what we want versus what we need. And those are the things that I have to figure out. And it's not easy. And like I said, it's subjective. You know, you may totally disagree with me on a policy decision, and that's okay. We can have that. We can have that debate. And there's 18 opinions in this instance that matter. 17 legislators and one county executive that have to find out a way to compromise or figure out how to get it done. So that's what we're doing right now. The budget itself is uh, 1.8 billion dollars. Uh, it was $1.8 billion when we walked in the door six years ago. So we are finding ways to manage and to lead in ways that still accomplish what we need to do. But just as your wages in many ways have been stagnant since the collapse in 09, 08, is for us to find ways to do things better or more efficient or to make the tough decision that we don't need what we've had we don't need it any longer, either at the level it's been at 
or we can do things differently, and we've had to do that. But to stay stagnant, to stay the exact same, means we just add up what our expenses are and just raise taxes to make up the difference. That's what we did have in this county, and that's why we had nearly 20% tax increases in a few short years before we got there. So we decided that that was unacceptable, and as a result, uh, we have worked very, very hard. We have a lot less employees. We have about, I think it's 18% less employees in the six years. Most of that has been through attrition. When people leave, we don't fill the position. Uh, we had two different retirement incentives, one combined with the state, which was very effective in 2010, and one this year that we did proactively, knowing the budget was going to be tough, but proactively asking people if they wanted to separate from the county, we would pay them to do that. And in the short term, we actually made a little money. In the long term, we make a lot more because when we replace that employee, uh, the new person comes in at a much, much lower level, uh, and our contracts that we've been able to renegotiate or negotiate with our unions, um, one of which has not been settled. It's been six, six years, six years, with an, a quote, an expired contract. But you have to understand how a contracts, quote, expire in New York, uh, which is very unique. There's only one state in the nation that has something called the Triborough Amendment, and that says that any public contract, public employee contract that expires, never expires. <laughs> All the terms stay the exact same until something is renegotiated. So our CSEA workers have been working uh, with their base salaries. They also get overtime. They also get step increases. They also get longevity payments each year. And sometimes they'll get a retroactive payment in a renegotiated contract, if an arbitrator does that. And they've gotten free health care. So they haven't had a contract with no increases. They've had increases each year. And they very well may get a big increase if and when there's a settlement. So we have to balance that out with what we can afford. And when I say what we, the taxpayer, that's everybody in this room. Now, some may say, hey, we're not getting taxed enough, or I'm fine paying 5% more each year in taxes. And there's a lot of others who are saying, don't you dare raise my taxes. I can't afford it. And that's what we hear all over the place. Now, we're in a time where, because of the budget, there are protests. The ones outside, by the way, is a totally separate issue. <laughs> but the, um, the protests, because people feel that they should get the same exact level or higher every year. And, and that's what we have to deal with, and that's okay. That's part of the process. That's fine. I'm, I'm good with that. That's a healthy process. Um, getting back to our workers, before anyone wants to start a telethon for our county workers, just let me know um, if you're okay with the average salary and benefits at $130,000 a year, because that's what it is. Now, CSEA and others will say, oh, that's not what we make. But they forget to count that they're getting free health care and you're paying for that. They forget to count that their pensions and everything else has to be paid for by you. And they forget to tell you that automatically when you change the calendar on January 1st, they get longevity payments, no productivity changes. They get step increases automatically which means they might go from 70000 to 74000 automatically without any base salary increase. So, you know, when, as people are learning about what we're dealing with in government, this is a model that was instituted, you know, in the 1960s in a very different time with very stringent civil service rules that make it very difficult for the employer, i.e. the taxpayer, to make changes to find efficiency. So unfortunately, the blunt tool that we have is kind of the only tool if the unions don't agree to make some changes, which oftentimes they don't, is to have, have less workers. And that's not ideal, but that's sort of what we have to do. So we, we constantly have to reinvigorate ourselves and reinvent ourselves, and that's what we've been doing. Um, so the budget for the sixth straight year had a 0% tax increase. And that's not a slogan. That's a tool that we use when we say we're not raising taxes. It's a tool that we use to keep, A, money in the pockets of people who pay the bills so you can determine what's essential in your own life. But it also makes us, 
our managers, our department heads, and the elected officials. It keeps us disciplined on spending. Otherwise, it would be very easy, as I said, to go back to the philosophy of, here's all the things we want, here's all the things we have to pay for, so what do we got and what do we need? What's the difference? Okay, it's 7% tax increase this year. That's what it's going to be. That's not what our philosophy is. So I think the discipline has worked. We found the balance. Is everyone happy? No. No one's always going to be happy. But on balance, I think it's the right thing to do. On, um, on Playland, and let me talk about Playland for a second, and then we'll take your questions. Uh, on Playland, obviously, as you know, Playland has um, – been very costly to the county over the years. I'll start off by saying I love Playland, and my goal has been to fix Playland, to make sure Playland stays forever and ever, but gets better, because I think Playland as it is is a very tired amusement park. And the cost to refurbish it would be tens of billions of dollars that we would all have to pony up. And philosophically, I just don't think a government should be running an amusement park. That's my own version of where I think uh, we should be doing as a government. Uh, but be that as it may, we own it. We've owned it since 1928. It's a gem. It's something we all love. It's, and I know it's, it's even probably more special to people on this side of the county because you're very close to it physically. So it's something that we wanted to save. And we are this close to doing that in that the agreement that we have signed with the management company would really be a win-win for the county taxpayers. The company that would come in, uh, which was unanimously passed by the county board, would put in about $25 million into work at Playland to make it refurbished, to bring it back to life, to add new rides, to do the things that really we haven't been able to. And as a result, you've had attendance decline. You've had people who, quite frankly, because of uh, some of the deaths that occurred on those rides uh, more than 10 years ago. You've had moms and dads saying, you know what, uh, maybe I don't want to go to Playland. So we've had the attendance sharply decline. The expenses go up. And, and unlike a private company that's in it to make a profit, so they're always at their best, they're always putting new things there to, to attract people, the county county workers and everyone, there's no profit motive. And so it's, you know, all right, wait online. All right, I'm close to overtime. All right, Burger King is your best food choice. And that's not what's going to make Playland wonderful again. So the new company that's coming in, and we have extended the option time simply because we want to make sure it's done right. And if that takes a little longer to do, that's fine. There's a lot of details because it's not like it's a private piece of property because it's government owned, because it's intertwined with all of the labor laws and civil service laws and everything else, it took a very long time to work out the details. And to this company's credit, they've stood in there, even though it gets frustrating after a while, because every question leads to 10 more legal opinions. So what we want to do is, just like a, a landlord and a renter, there are obligations that we have because we own the property. What happens if a sewer breaks underneath the Dragon Coaster? Is that their responsibility or is that our responsibility? You know, those are the things that we're all working through. What they will do is they will accelerate uh, all of the capital improvements in the first several years, which was important to us because we don't want them stringing this out for 15 years. And if something doesn't go right financially for them in the first five, six, seven years, they bail out. We want to make sure that they front load all of the work, and then they're going to be in it for the long term. Now, how the deal is structured is the county will receive $300,000 a year as a fee for them to come in, and that increases every year. The county will also uh, get from them $2.5 million up front. The county will also, once they get back and they put in their almost $25 million in capital improvements, and that should be about seven years. The county then will start sharing in the profits at 7.5% from the company. So it's a good deal. Uh, it'll be much more vibrant as a park. Uh, the marshlands are off limits. The beach and the pool area will be cleaned up. 
the pool is leaking tremendous amount of water, by the way. So the pool needs to be fixed and, and made something special. And that area will all be, again, uh, dealt with in the next couple of years. So that's where we're at with Playland. That's where we're at with the budget. I'd be more than happy to, to take any questions that you have. Um, the summit question is this. Well, we have a couple of them, and it relates to the budget. Am I still clear? OK. Um, you did discuss the fact that there were voluntary separations and that the budget has been kept flat for the last six years, well, the five flat and proposed flat budget. Um, there was a reduction at the same time in federal and state aid, and a a less than anticipated benefit from sales tax. So if there is, is no increase in the tax levy, at some point following that trajectory, will there not be a decline in the services to the residents of the community? because there's just going to be less money. I can't operate my house on what I was operating it on six years ago. So that would be our question, our first question. Good question. I, and I omitted those facts, actually, that the challenges that we face are the federal government, the state government uh, are giving either less or the same amount in aid. But the biggest problem, and we've talked about this before, and I know Schools talk about this, and your village and your town talks about this, about all these unfunded mandates where the federal government and the state government are forcing county to do their projects, and they don't give us the bills. They give us the bills, they don't pay the bills. The costs are almost $1.4 billion for these mandated programs. $1.4 billion out of our $1.8 billion budget. They give us, so nicely of them, they give us about 400 something million dollars. That gap has to be made up by all of us. So on January 1st, 75% of the budget is already out the door for their programs. So your property tax, by the way, for all intents and purposes, is a state property tax from now on. That's really what it is. You know, because we're left with very little, and what we do have left, we have to pay for our contracts. We have to pay for the things that we want, parks, et cetera, Playland. Playland's not, we're not obligated to run Playland. We choose to do Playland. So we've tried to find a different way to do it as opposed to just continuously using more and more tax dollars. Uh, so those are some very big challenges that we face. Now, if we didn't do anything, if we didn't take proactive actions, your taxes would have gone up tremendously. Now, as it is, there's already a cry from some to just raise taxes 2%. You know, go to the cap. But by the way, the cap is, is false. The cap numbers change all the time. It's not 2%. But let's just use 2% as the number. If we had raised the cap 2% a year, if we had raised taxes 2% a year, that would have been $317 million out of Westchester's pockets over the last six years. $317 million. It also would not have forced us to make any difficult choices that we should have made. Now that $317 million, in my estimation, is better spent by small businesses. It's better spent by you and not me choosing what I want to spend it on or the federal government choosing what it wants to spend it on. So those are the choices that we have to make. And the status quo means you constantly fall behind. So we have been proactive in what we've had to do to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah, we've had to make some tough choices, but I mean, that's what I get paid for and that's what the 17 legislators get paid for. And ultimately, if you don't like those choices, at the end of the day, you make changes. The voters make changes. But we've, we've had to do that or we have been bleeding more and more residents. Just to follow up on the budget question, um, among the cuts that is in your proposed budget is to April's Children, um, Hudson Valley Legal Services, I think, and um, my sister's place. And accepting that you're making choices, those are probably the most vulnerable segments of our society. And if they do not 
get assistance from the county, where would you suggest they get help from? Well, first of all, <clears throat> as I said, there's like 5,000 lines in the budget. And yes, budgets change. Uh, we had in the past, because the daycare program was deep in debt and very, very expensive, we made a policy decision to stabilize that program, the child care, afford, um, affordable daycare. So we made a policy decision to raise the rate for the parents in that program to pay a little bit more for their own children, and we would still heavily subsidize those. Below the poverty level is still 100% covered. We're talking about non-obligations by the county, where we have chosen to do this for people who are on the lower income level, uh, and we have continued that. But by taking the corrective measures that we did in the past, we were able to stabilize that program and we were able to expand the program for more parents. Now, there were screaming and yelling and the world was gonna to come to an end and all that when we made that decision. But that program has been strengthened because we did that and there are more families in that program now. We didn't have to touch that this year because we made that hard choice back then. Uh, the bus routes, we had to make some decisions over the last several years because we had empty buses that were very expensive running at all times of the day, and we had to say, well, look, we gotta make some changes here because it's becoming unaffordable, and we'd have to increase the fares dramatically. So yeah, we had to make some changes. Screaming and yelling, and the world was gonna come to an end, and nobody was ever gonna get to work. That didn't turn out to be the case. We had to make system changes. We've done that, and we didn't have to make any more now because we corrected it. Some of, the talk, some of the proposals that you're talking about, and specifically, are to some of our nonprofit agencies. Now, there are a lot of different choices. There are a lot of different domestic violence programs. To say that because we've cut a little bit in one particular program that there will be no money for any domestic violence program is totally incorrect. There's federal subsidies, there are state subsidies, there are private nonprofits here that also fundraise. So to say that there have been some changes will adversely affect is not something that we came to that same conclusion in. Uh, anytime you take a pencil out of a budget, there's screaming and howling. And any program that you make a change to is devastating. You know, the arts of Westchester, which I strongly support, there, the arts in Westchester, the Arts Westchester Council, gets over $1.6 million from Westchester County government. That's all tax dollars. Now, people have said, wait a minute. What are we giving $1.6 million to the arts when they don't need it? They could raise that kind of money when you're raising daycare costs or bus fares. And this is the stuff we have to deal with every day. Now, in those six years, when we did have to make adjustments to the daycare program and ask parents, lower income parents, to pay a little bit more for their own kids, we didn't change money to the arts. We didn't cut any money to the arts. This year, when we were able to stabilize the daycare program, we decided, look, to balance the budget, we've got to give a little bit less to the arts. We're not going in houses and ripping down, you know, portraits from walls. You know, we've got to put this in perspective here. I've heard words like, devastate. Things are not going to be devastated if you take away a little money. They'll make up that difference. And what we do for the arts, by the way, is we give them one lump sum. They then decide among themselves how to distribute that money to the various arts programs and groups throughout the county. We could take it back in house. We could take all $1.6 million and we can decide who gets the arts money. We don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So we give them the money. So if we give them a little less, they can still fund every organization with a little less dollars, or they can make decisions that that group is really shouldn't get money, or but that's their choice. But to say that because we took away a little money from the Arts Council, where they still get money from the federal government, the state government, uh, a lot of philanthropists, and private organizations, that the arts as we know it in Westchester is coming to an end. It's just typical budget talk stuff. And if I thought it was going to devastate the arts in Westchester, we wouldn't have done that. We can survive with a little less.
Yes. I feel they haven't had a chance to ask. This actually has to do with Save the Sound litigation. Um, the Save the Sound litigation uh, charges that the local Sound Shore municipalities and the county are responsible for contamination of the sound resulting from leaking and degraded sewer lines. So what is the county intending to do to find a long-term sustainable solution to repair or replace the sewer lines, and where will the money come from to achieve that? And I think that's always really important to those of us who live here on the Sound and to those of us who also worry about flooding. Yes, and again, so inflow and infiltration, um, our sewage pipes, water pipes, they are aging. And one of the things that I've advocated is capital improvements to infrastructure. I think that is the essence of what government should be doing, by the way, because there is no special interest for that. Every single person benefits when we have good roads and sewer and water and that. Now, some would say, you know, everyone benefits from the arts. Well, that's true, but not everyone goes to the museums and not everybody uses daycare and not everybody, but every single person does use our infrastructure. Our bridges should be safe, our roads. There are a lot of them. And everyone can say, well, you know, there isn't enough money. I mean, look, to do all the work we would need to do immediately or that we would want to do would be beyond astronomical. You would solidify the number one ranking for the highest taxes in the world forever. So we have to prioritize which we are doing. Now, here, we are part of a consortium where all of the local municipalities also have an obligation uh, to do their sewers and, and septics and water. So we are working this through with all these municipalities because it is not the sole responsibility of the county. It is the responsibility of everybody. So we're trying to work, and we've had discussions recently with our communities. Nobody wants to sue everybody else. That's not the way we want to do things. We want to work through this with our municipalities. So our, we've had ongoing discussions. We've had the bio-nutrient uh, plant uh, here in New Rochelle and Mamaronek. We've put a lot of money into that, over $200 million uh, into cleaning up the discharge into cleaning up these uh, plants. Uh, very successfully, they're coming to a conclusion. Uh, we're doing infrastructure repairs uh, at our wastewater treatment plant in Yonkers and throughout the county. So we're making constant upgrades, uh, but we're also just like you're doing in your house. You might have a chip paint in the corner of a room that you never use, and you might have the boiler going, and we've got to figure out which is more important, just like you do, and prioritize. And we're doing that. So we have some questions. My name is Susan Van Dolsen. Um, you mentioned that you love Playland and parks are very important to you. you your administration negotiated a uh, license agreement with Spectra Energy to expand a dangerous gas pipeline in Blue Mountain Park by a large diameter to a large diameter. It violates the state parkland alienation process. Two of the state legislators came to you with a letter. Have you responded to them to that letter? And that is not my question. Uh, my question is, all right, I, I hope you have responded to them. My question is, your administration signed this license agreement over this summer, but you didn't sign it. It was signed by par the Parks Commissioner, Kathleen O'Connor, I believe her name is. And there's a conflict of interest clause in that license agreement, which says that there should not be gas and oil conflict. You've received money from the gas and oil industry. Is that why you didn't sign it and why you had the parks commissioner sign it? In your campaign, now I don't, I don't know, I don't have a record, but I know as a, I'm asking you if that conflict of interest of you receiving money from gas and oil as a candidate preclude you from signing this and wonder why your name's not on this agreement. What is your reason for not having your name on the agreement? Okay. A couple things that need to be cleared up and, and um, this Spectra has received a lot of misinformation. So I'm going to clear it up now. First of all, there is five acres in a 1,500 acre park in Blue Mountain in northern Westchester. That is what is being discussed here. 
they already have a gas line there since 1952. It is their property since 1952. The federal government oversees this pipeline change. What they want to do is go in to their property and change their, prop, their pipeline because it's getting very old, which by the way would prevent leaks from the natural gas line that goes through that already. I'm going to answer your question because you have put out a lot of misinformation. You also made a very bad accusation, so I want to clear that up too. I, so the federal government oversees this process. The federal government has approved this process for them to come in on their property and make these changes. Now, could we have objected? We probably could have objected, but we would have been overruled and it would have been through either eminent domain and we would have gotten nothing and they would have done much more damage or clear cutting. So what we allowed them to do, okay, ma'am, you can either, you can either listen in, okay. Okay, you can disagree all you want, but I'm giving you the facts. So what the county decided to do was instead of having it taken through eminent domain, or the federal government just saying yes, we decided to negotiate against something that we probably shouldn't have had to negotiate with because we weren't really do anything. But we got over $2 million to use to stabilize the budget, $2 million to use to help the rest of our park system. And so we did something because it was their right anyway to go in there on their property. Let's also remember, this is five acres, not wide, five acres of 1,500 acres for an existing pipeline that is deteriorating. That is what was being discussed right now. So we don't have the ultimate say. It is not an alienation of parkland. They own that land anyway. They own the land. It is not an alienation of parkland. It was completely within the right of the county. Uh, we obviously had this vetted and made sure that that was appropriate, and that's what we did. So. You can argue all you want, and I'm free to argue with you the rest of the day if you'd like. But that's the, f not here, but that, that's what happened. So to sit there and say that we are clear cutting an entire park, they will not only pay us for property that they didn't have to pay us for, for something that they were already going to get permission to do, but they're also going to plant back what they needed to do and make sure they restore the property as best that they can and we will make sure that they do that. Who has the authority to sign it? Of course the commissioner has the authority to sign it. Uh, as far as your inference that we said yes, because by the way, if you want to look at filings and you want to be truthful about this, go find out what Andrew Cuomo accepted from the oil and gas industry. No, but you're making the inference that because we agreed to let them do what they're already legally agreed to do, I have taken in my campaigns last year for governor, basically nothing from the oil and gas industry. Go look at what Andrew Cuomo accepted from the oil and gas industry. That's what really happened. Anyway, that was the inference which I didn't appreciate, but go ahead. Do I have another question? Uh, Bill Lawyer, I live in Rye. I just want, could you give us an update on the affordable housing uh, situation as it ties into the South Shore area? Uh, yes. Well, the, you're talking about the HUD settlement. Okay. Let me first start off by saying, and, and I don't know if anyone read the, uh, the journal news on Sunday, uh, I wrote an op-ed which sort of explained where we were uh, and refuted the, the allegations of uh, the other side. Um, some very important things have happened in the courts over the last several months that benefit Westchester County and repudiate what the federal government is saying and the allegations that they have been making. First and foremost, the agreement that was signed by Andy Spano in 09 and ratified by the county board at that time requires the county to build 750 units of what's called fair and affordable housing based on income in 31 eligible communities based upon uh, the wording of the settlement it was from the 2000 census and if community had seven percent or less hispanic and three percent or less african-american population then that is a quote eligible community 
under the settlement terms. Okay. Uh, we got in in January 1st, 2010, which was the first day that the settlement actually took effect. We have seven years or till the end of next year to complete the settlement. Now, the settlement requires us to build the 750. Each year, there are benchmarks along the way that we need to meet or exceed with regard to financing for these projects and building permits for these projects. They all have to be at 750 by the end of next year. Now, the good news is, despite some of our differences along the way in the interpretation of the settlement, but also with the allegations that the federal government has been making and the new requirements that the federal government were trying to force upon the county, that's where we had objections. The settlement terms, we've always said, look, whether we like them or not, we'll do the settlement terms because that's what was agreed upon. We have met or exceeded the benchmarks every year for the settlement. That's the good news. If you look at the settlement, the only area where the county is financially at risk, where there are fines, are on the benchmarks, the financial and the um, building permit benchmarks. So it was incumbent upon the county to work with our developers, to work with our communities, to find locations, and to get housing built for two reasons. One, we have an obligation to do it. But two, we want to build affordable housing. We've been building affordable housing in this county for a long time, before I got here and after I leave, hopefully. And we will continue to do so. And we've worked with various communities. And affordable housing comes in very different forms and different ways. And affordable housing, by the way, is not affordable to build. It's very expensive. But we've made that obligation to do that and we'll continue. Now, the bumps along the way have been that the federal government and they've admitted this in a letter to us in, in May of 2011. That's where we started butting heads. The federal government started making new demands upon the county. Now, I don't know about you, and you know, if there are two people who are going through a divorce, or if you've got a contract to sell your house, a contract is a contract, and the terms that are once agreed upon are the terms. The federal government has come in, and they're one side to a two-party settlement. So you have to understand, just because the federal government alleges something doesn't mean it's true. In fact, the courts have now said they have been totally incorrect. So what we have said is, we will do what we're supposed to do, but just because the federal government now makes new demands, which by the way are very expensive demands, which would have a significant impact on our taxes and on our current programs that we have to fund, we have said, look, we disagree with you, and there's a process when you disagree for both sides. There's a federal magistrate that you go to first. There's the district court judge, the federal judge, who oversees this settlement. There's a monitor who, quite frankly, by the way, uh, this is a kangaroo court that was set up at the very beginning. The federal monitor, you would think, is supposed to be an honest referee. The federal monitor is hired by Housing and Urban Development and serves at will to HUD. So the federal monitor serves at the pleasure of HUD, of one side in this two-party disagreement. Could you imagine the NFL referees in a Jets-Giants game all wearing Giants blue and every flag goes against the Jets? That's exactly what we've been dealing with now for six plus years. So it's not a fair system. The recourse that we have when the monitor unilaterally starts attacking our communities, including uh, Mamaronek, starts attacking our communities and making allegations, and HUD does the same, our recourse is to A, prove them wrong, which we have done, and B, to use the dispute resolution and to go into the courts. Now, two big things have happened very recently. The federal government was in favor of it before they were against it. The Chappaqua development at the end of 2014 had enough units that we were financing and the county board put financing in place. Uh, that put us over the benchmark for 2014. The federal government approved it. Then all of a sudden, they decided to change their mind. And in early 2015, the monitor and the federal government said, hey, Westchester, we're taking those off the scoreboard. 
and as a result, you don't meet your benchmarks, and as a result, you will be fined, and as a result, you are in breach. And we said, whoa, 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 whoa. First of all, we did what we're supposed to do. You already approved it. And what's the problem here? So we went to court, and the magistrate just ruled recently that, yes, those do count, that, yes, the county has met its obligations, no, the county is not in breach, a second big issue was the money. We all like to talk about money. The old adage, money is the root of all evil. Okay, so here's the deal with the money. The money is what originally got Westchester sued in 2006. The money comes in the form of federal grants, community development block grant money and a few other grants. Most communities have taken it. The county has taken it uh, through the years. And as a result, when you take the money, you need to certify that the money is being spent in the right way and that you are doing the right studies that are required. Okay, the money was spent in the right way. There was no misappropriation by the Spano administration or anything like that. But what the federal lawsuit was under the False Claims Act of 1863 was that the county had made some false certifications and submitted those to the federal government, that they considered race in, as, a, um, as an obstacle to housing, et cetera. The county had not done that. There was no finding of fact, nor was there any admission by the county that it was done um, purposely. And if it did go to federal court, that was a high hurdle that would have had to been found that the county maliciously and falsified these documents the county decided not to defend itself, and the federal government decided not to prosecute, so they decided to settle, and these were the settlement terms that we've been living with. The federal grant money that the county was promised, for they went in three-year cycles. The 11, 12, and 13 money was over about $20 million that the county gets and it passes through to our communities for some housing stuff, sidewalks, all these different projects. Unfortunately, the federal government used that money as a threat if the county did not capitulate to their new demands. Now, I could not in good conscience sit there and capitulate to the federal government in their new demands, which would vastly weaken the authority of our local governments to control land use. So if the federal government in the future said, well, we're going to determine zoning and we're going to determine that we want affordable housing on the Long Island Sound over there, then they would determine that. We feel very strongly that the village officials, the town officials in Larchmont, in Mamaroneck, should determine that. Because under the state constitution, land use decisions are the authority of local governments local elected officials who know your community the best, not some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. dictating how Westchester will be built. Now, there are laws governing proper use of development. Zoning, by the way, which is sort of at the heart of this, zoning determines what can and what cannot be built, and it affects everyone equally. It does not determine who lives where, it determines that this area is for retail, this area is for housing, this area is for multi-developments, et cetera. And that's your decision. But every community has within it affordable housing, has within it zones for different type of housing. How you develop is up to you. That was what is at stake here. And that is now a national debate because under the current administration in Washington, they have put a rule out called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, going forward, if you take federal grant money, the federal government now has much more say in local land use. That's going to be a policy decision by each community, not only nationwide, but here in Westchester, whether to continue taking that money. We have determined, as a county, that it is no longer appropriate to do so. So going forward, we are not taking any more community development block grant money. We will determine our local tax dollars what's appropriate and not take that money because that will cede power to the federal government to do what they want to do. We're not willing to do that. 
The money in the past, the $20 million, we did go back to federal court because we felt that money was promised and accepted in good faith by the county and by our communities and that the federal government had an obligation to give that money where it was already accepted. On that narrow decision, the Second Circuit of the federal courts ruled that unfortunately HUD had the right under this settlement terms to take that money away. But, and here's the but, and it's very important, and I'll, and I'll leave you with this, with this question. The language in that decision by the federal government, by the federal courts was extraordinarily important to the county and to our municipalities and nationwide, because it, what it said was, there has been no finding at any time of housing discrimination in Westchester. And so the federal government can make all the claims they want, but they can't make that determination. And that the county cannot be um, penalized, and the federal government cannot link federal money with zoning. And we have proven, and Pace University backed it up independently, that our zoning is not exclusionary. What it is, it's indisputable, it's expensive. It's very expensive. And taxes are the highest in the nation. That is the impediment for anybody of any color, of any religious background, of any heritage. That is an equal problem for everybody. That is why we have had a zero tax increase for six years, because it is extraordinarily important to hold the line so people do have opportunities. So it is very important to understand the facts and the accusations. The accusations have been proven to be untrue now, not by us, one side in this two-sided dispute, but by federal courts. And that's very important to know. Yes. Yes. As long as I can get a blueberry muffin toasted with butter and jelly to go and a coffee. No, look, what, I don't, just want me to clarify one thing. Does discrimination exist in Westchester and in this world? Of course it does. Racism exists everywhere. Look at the buffoon Donald Trump last night, what he said. I mean, that is a ridiculous comment to make. But, but, instant, but, no, let me just finish this. But Westchester in its policies does not discriminate in housing, and that was very, very important, and each community and we did a, a Bronxville, Mount Vernon, back-to-back -back zoning comparison. If zoning were the issue, then we would have two very different outcomes between Mount Vernon and Bronxville. The disparity in income is very big. The disparity in, in a lot of demographics are very different. But what is unique is that Mount Vernon and Bronxville have almost the exact same zoning codes exact same what what's permitted and what's not permitted so zoning is very similar around Westchester zoning is not the issue I agree income is the issue and taxes are the issue those are the impediments that affect everybody yes
what are the added costs? Okay. As far as the specific costs, I have no idea. You know, I, I, I think the question, I know you asked something similar last year too, I think. We talked afterwards. <laughs> Not about the actual costs, but about, about guns. Um, the, the question was, what are the specific costs related to gun violence in Westchester and, and nationwide, I guess? I don't know the answer to the specific costs. I will tell you, though, that we have been proactive with an initiative that we have called Safer Communities. And this was born out of the Newtown, Connecticut shootings, quite frankly. And what it does is, for Westchester, we have, and it's been ongoing, we did not want a, a rush to judgment, nor did we want a headline. We wanted actually something that was proactive, was comprehensive, and something that would work, and something that would benefit people as an ongoing basis. So here's what we have been doing under the Safer Communities Initiative since Newtown, Connecticut. First, we had Commissioner Bill Bratton, who was not the commissioner of NYPD at the time. Uh, we had him in in 2013, I think it was, at SUNY Purchase to discuss with all of law enforcement. This was the first time in, that we know of in the history of the county where every law enforcement agency was represented, federal, state, local, and county, where we talked with educators from our schools in attendance together on how to deal with securing our buildings, God forbid there's an active shooter, and how to deal with best practices and how to train and coordinate that training. That's been ongoing. A lot has been learned worldwide about how to deal. It used to be a hostage situation. Now it is completely and utterly changed on how to deal with something. Now you go in with full force immediately to try to end this quickly. Um, we have also dealt with the mental health aspect, including with our schools. Um, youth mental health first aid is something that we have gotten awards for and a lot of recognition for. That is, we're working with our mental health community and our schools to identify children who really need help, who need assistance. And it's teaching coaches, it's teaching adults that come in contact with children who may not have a mental health background to identify some warning signs and to deal with that with professionals. Uh, we're dealing with chronic absenteeism with Malvernon and Yonkers specifically. What we've also found is there is a major link between absenteeism and that child who doesn't go to school ending up in our criminal justice system, ending up in drug violence, uh, gun violence, gangs, etc. So we're attacking the issues in a holistic way as opposed to just having a discussion nationwide where we could actually do things here and be aggressive about them. So um, I'm proud of some of these things that we're doing and I think they're, they're actually beneficial and it's something that's ongoing as opposed to let's just go out, scream and yell, have a press conference and then not deal with anything. But there's no database about I don't have the data. There might be, but I don't, I don't know off, off him. Mark that down. Next year, we will have the answer. Safer Communities, by the way, is on the westchestergov.com website where you can actually go in and look at the comprehensive um, tactics that we've used to combat some of these issues. You can do something, but it'll have no effect. And that's part of the issue. You know, we have this big debate, and that's okay. Yes. Yeah. But I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, we're all in the blast zone. That's. Our children are not safe. If you don't feel safe. Our children are not safe. And if you're worried about taxes, where is the bottom line? Where is the line item for our EMS and first responders when these pipelines explode? Okay. Indian Point, everyone has said, will explode. Indian Point, Indian Point will, will not. Down right now the, the, the federal now government. Then why do you live there? What, tax is too high? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Listen, with all due respect, there has not been... 
Thank you very much. I'm sorry that this has happened to your breakfast, and I appreciate the opportunity to come in here. Thank you very much. Have a great holiday, everybody. another guy that I can, it knows all the answers. Anybody else know where the Marina Cal Center is? It's on, all right, Keith, you're on. It's, uh, it's on Stanley Avenue. And we're on Stanley Avenue, is it, Keith? It's uh, right across from the new condo uh, building there. All right. And what does it house? Right now? Yes. Right now, it, ha it houses the community council center. All right. So that, along with the late 1800s and early 1900s, where a lot of the um, a, a lot of local problems were taken care of by missions, uh, and that was the St. Michael's house, the uh, Mermanic Health Center was created to provide. It was our, our own little Mermanic Obamacare. Um, it, it provided. Uh, uh, it, it was started by the. Here, these are really neat names. The Lending Comforts to the Sick Society and Child Welfare Society. Those two groups um, got together and purchased the property in, uh, and it was a, the building was erected in 1926. And it was the, aided by the generous gifts of the Mermanic Free Kindergarten Association and local citizens. In 1946, it was written, today, the health center provides prenatal care of mothers and established an orthopedic clinic and dental clinic and is the milk station for the community. More and more, the old milk station has become the health center of America. Today, the health center program is guided by a number of people. Um, Nurses are available for the care of the sick in the home as well as for the education and health su supervision 
clinics and classes are conducted regularly. Pediatric and social hygiene clinics are conducted weekly. Chest clinics twice monthly. Orthopedic clinics quarterly. And special immunization semi-annually. The milk station. I don't know what it did, but it, uh, it, I'm, I'm reading here. Uh, I have no idea what the milk station is. Maybe they had a bunch of goats. I don't know. Jeff, Yes. You omitted that it was also a 24-hour running facility, and it was an overnight infirmary. Yep. This this really provided a great amount of health care for the community. I mean, when you think about dental and orthopedic and prenatal and so on, it was quite an organization. And this was all, mostly all with private funds. The building, the purchase of the land, the erection of the building, and the operation of the clinic was all mostly with private funds. The, the village of Romantic provided, I think I read, three nurses. Uh, so probably in the, in the 60s and 70s, it started its decline because our health system changed. And the board of directors um, in the 70s decided that they had to close the clinic and, um, and do something with the building. And I remember some of those people. There was a woman, Norma La Rosa, from Aranic who was on the board, and, and my friend Busy Montesano's wife, Mary, was on the board. And they, uh, they terminated the organization, and they gave the building to the village of Aranic, but with a restrictive covenant that it always be used for health-related purposes. And twice I have gone to a Village of Mermanic Board of Trustees meeting where it was proposed that they rent on commercial basis to whoever wanted to rent that building. And I had to stand up and say, I remember those people on the board and it has to be used for a health-related purpose. Washingtonville Housing Alliance had its first office in the basement of that building before it moved to Library Lane. <laughs> and uh, and Ellen Levy was the uh, executive director, and it was a, an above-ground basement, but with stone walls, and but it served its purpose. And along came uh, the community counseling center, which talk about uh, protecting our youth and 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 finding and and providing some some uh, mental health to our community. The the Marana Community Center operates conducts itself in that building. And, and Mark Levy is the, is the, and perhaps we ought to have a program with that, uh, but it's been a great use and obviously health related. Um, and that's my story. <laughs> By the way, again, my source is a 1946 little ditty, The Story of a Friendly Village by William Gershom Pulcher. And I happened to show this to Joe Germano. And he said, oh yeah, he was my history teacher at the high school. 